Getting real estate professionals to quiet down is the hardest part of this job, but so glad to, to see everybody enjoying um, their visits. I'm Kim Butler with Hall Group, and I'm the 2022 chair for TREK, and I'm excited about today's program. Uh, the speaker series program today is a conversation with Crescent real estate founder, John Goff. I wanna thank our generous sponsors, Bank of Texas, Stuart Title, and the Dallas Morning News. They provide us the opportunity to present compelling and rich content for you. You know, great companies and organizations keep their mission statements first and foremost as they're making decisions. Trek's mission is to cultivate relationships in our commercial real estate industry, to catalyze community investment, influence public policy, propel careers, and develop the leaders of tomorrow. We also believe strongly that relationships are the lifeblood of career success, community investment, and civic responsibility. You know, let's face it, it has been more challenging the last two years to cultivate and maintain our relationships, but taking the time to nourish those relationships makes for a very rich life and career. So I encourage you to reconnect with someone perhaps that you haven't seen in a while. Now let's get on to today's main event. I've got just a couple of announcements first. Our next Market Matters Breakfast is on Thursday, September the 22nd. It will be a panel discussion about the state of the hospitality industry. It's going to be moderated by our favorite Christine Perez of DCEO, and will feature Dupree Scoville of Woodbine Development, John Bure of East Still Secured, and Mahul Patel of Newcrest Image. Registration will be available very soon on our brand new website, which you should visit, by the way. I encourage you also to support Trek Community Investors on North Texas Giving Day on September 22nd. North Texas Giving Day is one of the largest philanthropic events in North Texas, and your donations help us fund neighborhood revitalization with, let me say that again, neighborhood revitalization with uh, Dallas Catalyst Project uh, and the Dallas Collaborative for Equitable Development. It also supports Trek's affordable housing loan program and economic development projects throughout the area. Early giving starts on September the 1st, and you can make a difference every day from September the 1st uh, to the big day on September 22nd. So please support Trek community investors. We also have a few, and I might add just a very few, tables left for fight night. Breaking ground is the theme this year. It's coming up on Thursday, September 29th at the Hilton Anatole. A great time will be had by all for certain. I'd now like to welcome our program's chair, Jeff Montgomery with Republic Title to introduce our speakers. So glad that you're here with us. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today to introduce the two gentlemen that y'all are all here to see. Uh, both have detailed bios in the program, so please check it out. But as most of you know, Bill Cauley was our 2020 Trek Chair. He was also the 2020 DCEO Developer of the Year and a 2022 inductee to the NATCAR Hall of Fame. He's consistently recognized as one of the most influential business leaders in DFW. What you may not know about Bill is that he's the man behind the Trek podcast series, Legends of Commercial Real Estate. If you haven't listened, you're missing out because he's had several incredible interviews with uh, heavyweight, local heavyweight uh, real estate guys. Our program committee wanted to share Bill's skill as an interviewer in a live setting. So when John Golf agreed to participate, we knew it was a home run. John is definitely one of these heavyweights. He was inducted to the McCombs Business School Hall of Fame in 2014, hook em horns. Uh, John recently was honored by the DCEO with the Pioneer Award. He is in the NACAR Dallas Business Fort Worth Halls of Fame 
as well as the Texas Business Hall of Fame. I don't think there's a hall left. So let's get right to it. Let's welcome both these legends to the stage. You care what side you're sitting? Doesn't matter. Okay, you pick. All right. Is this mic on? This, this is, I just realized that I'm a legend. I didn't know I was. Um, you know, uh, it's been so fun doing these interviews because people want to know about John Goff, right? I mean, what you've accomplished and what you've been able to do in your career. And, you know, I, I think back on, uh, I used to work for the Bass family in Fort Worth and just kind of have watched your career and it's been very impressive. So I appreciate your time. And I appreciate you sitting down, and um, I'm just going to start firing and take it wherever it goes. Let's go for it. I, I do want to say thank you to you, Bill. Yeah. Um, we're old friends uh, from a long time ago. Yes. Several cycles ago. And also, I want to say thank you to this incredible crowd. Uh, a lot of old friends in the audience, as well as uh, some new friends. So thank you for showing up. You're packing them in, for sure. It's full. So when I was a kid, I really looked up to my dad. And my dad was like my best friend and idol. So when, my, when I was a kid, I always knew I wanted to be in the real estate business. I didn't know what that meant. But like when somebody was playing cops and robbers and they say, what are you, you, gonna, what are you? and I go, I'm a real estate guy. So when you were growing up, what was your plan? What did you think you would be? Well, I loved to build things. Um, I was, my dad was a coach, but he worked at a chemical plant. Um, we were in a small town, Lake Jackson on the coast. Uh, there wasn't a lot to do in Lake Jackson, so I found things fun to do, which was tip, typically taking things apart and rebuilding them, and I just had a real intense curiosity. Um, so I loved that, and I loved sports and all that, like most kids. Um, but when I got ready to go to school, I decided that I, and I needed to pay for part of my school, so I needed assistance in some way. And so I entered electrical engineering. Um, I was a decent math student and physics, and I kind of enjoyed, I was a bit of a geek in that regard. Um, so I went to the University of Texas, studied electrical engineering because Dow Chemical had a program where they desperately needed engineering graduates, yeah. and they would pay for your school if you agreed to work for them. So I did, um, kind of fast forward, I did three summers of internship with them, had my school paid for by, by Dow. Awesome. And it was that third summer, I got to interface with some business people on a plant that we were designing down in Brazil. And when I met with the business people, I realized like a light bulb went off in my head. I was on the wrong side of the table. <laughs> I enjoyed the engineering right. things, but it was incredibly detailed and uh, I looked at the business people and I had more in common with them. Uh, they were funny. Right. None of the engineers were all that funny. <laughs> uh, and I just realized I got to change my major. So I went and changed my major to uh, accounting and business at UT, got an accounting degree, and that's what happened. Okay, and so you were, um, and, and how did you run into Richard Rainwater and how did you become associated with him? Because you know, I worked for the Bass family, Robert Bass Land, for three years, and uh, I have nothing but high regard for Mr. Rainwater. He was such a special guy, really intelligent, but really quality person. Amazing man. I miss him every day. And I, Richard was like a father, like a brother, and a partner, kind of all wrapped into one. And it was a very interesting relationship we had. And for some reason, I was working at KPM, what was Pete Marwick back then, KPMG now, in the Fort Worth office. The Fort Worth office was a very important office of the firm because it had the Bass Brothers right. account. And so they were very active because of Richard as chief investment officer. And I actually worked out with him in the afternoons. And one day he said, hey, I need somebody full time, basically in my office, helping me from the firm. And so 
I oh my God, got annoyed awesome. in that position. So did you interface with him in your position, in your job? Yeah, or yeah. For, as, well, as well as working out with him? Yeah, for two, three years. Okay. And then he left the Basses in 86. Right. He called me and he said, John, I want you to come join me. And I was, I mean, it was lightning in a bottle. <laughs> right. The, that was what I'd been waiting for my entire career. Right. And so I said, done. You know, I didn't call home and I just, we're done. We're good. <laughs> you knew that was a good deal. I didn't even know what I was going to make. It didn't matter. Didn't matter, right. So I went to work for Richard in June of 87. So. And helped start Rainwater Inc. Right. And so like, it seems, my view of you is you're a contrarian. I, I kind of, th I think you make really good moves when everybody's hiding under their desk. And I also think um, you've got a calculated high risk tolerance. Would you agree with me on that? It, partly. Okay. Um, I'm definitely a contrarian, and I learned that from him, from right? an incredible guy uh, who was one of the best contrarians of them all. And I am, but in terms of taking risk, you know, yes, I take what I think people perceive as a lot of risk. But in my view, like investing in oil and gas in 2015 in a big way, a lot of people think you're crazy, you're going to lose your ass. I underwrite the heck out of that. I'm a data junkie. I yeah. look at lots of information. I don't always get it right. Right. But I underwrote that big investment in energy in 2015 by saying it's just way oversold. We're not replacing. I go on and on about the thesis. Right. But in my mind, I don't take big risks. I think the perception is I might. I also take big concentrated, I make big concentrated investments. I don't like to do a lot of really small things. It's just, yeah, I, I don't, it's not meaningful. Richard and I one time actually had, we hired a firm to come in and audit our results after we had been together for about eight years. And what we found is that 80% of the profits came out of 20% of the investments. Always. And all these little things were big distractions. Yep. Um, to just, just one quick story. So I started in June of 87. For those history buffs, many of you are too young for this, but in October of 87, we had what was called Black Monday. Yeah. Of Massive sell-off in the stock market. Richard called me into his office, and understand, you know, I'm 32 years old. I don't have a nickel. You don't make, you know, I didn't make any money in public right. accounting. Right. He called me into his office and he said, um, he said, hey, I'm going to get somebody on the phone and I'm going to get, um, I just want you to listen in on this because I, I, I want you to do something. So he gets this partner on the phone that was uh, uh, a guy that had been with Drexel Burnham and he was running a fund that was uh, still with, in partnership with the Bass family. And he said, uh, this guy's name was Dort. He said, hey, Dort, um, I got this young kid in my office. I want you to wire him $50 million. This, the, the market's collapsed, okay? I want you to wire him $50 million. John, I want you to put $50 million to work in the market. And I was With like, no guidance? Network. He just said zero. Three. Zero. So, God, I love that guy. In hindsight, you know, first of all, I was scared out of my mind. Yeah, okay? it's awesome, though. Palms were sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would love to think that Richard thought I was some boy genius and I wasn't going to screw it up. The reality was Richard was the ultimate contrarian and he knew the market was so oversold right. that this young kid is not going to goof this up. He could yeah. basically buy anything yeah. and it's going to go back up. Yeah. And now I sweated for a month or more you know, while I selected stocks and went in carefully and I put the 50 million to work and you know look it worked out well but again it was all timing right it wasn't that I was any and when you did that did you take big positions in what you bought or like big. yeah like I mean you've got 50 million did you buy I bought 30 five, about five names right so big bets yeah right. right but I knew them intensely right right I, I do think people look at like, I feel the same way about me. I, like, I, I'm okay with risk because I've studied it and I'm comfortable that there's great opportunity for the risk, right? Not always right either, but it, people will look at what you're doing, other people, and question it, and I get it. But I, I do think that risk is based on your gut, right? Or, or your, 
your homework going in. So before I get to the good stuff, what? give me a bad deal. What's your biggest mistake? Uh, probably the biggest mistake is a year or two after um, this, the, the Black Monday, uh, we had a couple of executives. By the way, every day at Richard's office was like a pickup basketball game. Yeah. It was just a who's who yeah. coming in the door, and it was crazy. Yeah. And it was just a handful of us. Yeah. Um, and Richard said, hey, John, you need to take this meeting. So I go into this meeting, a couple of executives from Phillips Van Heusen that you know, made the shirts. Yes. And they said, hey, we've got the ability to buy a subsidiary of this public company, and we can buy it, we think, really cheap. We need the money to do that. So I go through the math, and I you know, look at the deal, and end up saying, this is actually pretty interesting. You know, Back these two guys have been running the business. And so we do it, but I made a deal with them because, again, I hadn't made a big lick yet. You know, so I'm... I'm working, you know, I've got a little money, but not a lot, so I'm right. trying to find things where my money goes a long way, because Richard, the only way I got, really got paid was investing alongside of, mm -hmm. in our deals. So I over-engineered it. I told the guys, I said, look, how much money do you have to put up? They told me, I said, okay, well, all that's gotta go in. We'll put up, we'll match that, but if I'm able to get financing on this, our money gets paid down first. Well, I got financing so that was so incredible, we didn't need to put up any money. So I went to Richard and I said, Richard, I got this deal and we're gonna own you know, half this company and we're not gonna have to put up any money and the executive's gonna put up all the equity. And he's like, what, how'd you do that? I said, well, I got financing and you know, here's, here's the way the math works. And he said, that's incredible. So, you know, I hand him his share of the stock. I've got my share. That was a bad construct. I over-engineered that deal. And it blew up later because us as the capital investors and the management team were not unified. We had different starting points. Yep. And it just ended up being a big, big problem. Mm -hmm. And I, so I learned a lot. Yeah. So do you, one of the things I find is a bad deal with a good guy is going to work out. A great deal with a bad guy, you're toast. I really do think people um, are, the, are kind of the biggest problem in a deal that goes sideways. Would you agree with that? Oh, no, no question. Yeah. So no question. Talk, let's talk about creating Crescent. I mean... Um, was Richard involved in Crescent, or did you, is that when you left Richard? No, Richard, um, we were in the office, and we routinely had lunch together, and I went into lunch and said, hey Richard, I've got an idea, there's really nothing interesting to work on. I'd been working on oil and gas, I'd been managing his money in the stock market, I'd been, we, we did a big hospital deal with Rick Scott, so we, had, we were growing that business. Um, we had taken, uh, uh, you know, a bankrupt drilling company and turned it into what is now Insco, you know, a big offshore drilling company. And so I'd been working on all that. There was really not that much interesting other than the real estate business. And real estate was just in a ditch, a disaster, early 90s. Right. Okay. So I said, I'd like to take everything off my desk and I'd like to focus on this business plan. And I'd literally written it, written it, written it down on one page of a yellow pad. Real simple, which is what he liked. I walked him through the plan. He goes, I love it. He said, you put up your entire net worth, everything. Which my net worth at the time was, to me, very significant. But it was probably four or five million dollars. Right, right. And I had to put up all of that. And he said, and he scribbled on the paper, and I would wish I had that piece of paper. He scribbled on there how much he would allocate of his net worth, of his liquidity. Yeah. And so he said, get after it. So that was literally his involvement. So it got launched. Right. And I, you know, I was the first employee, and I started building this company by buying assets by the pound. Right. So I think... Um, the meltdown in 07, 08, and 09, the crescendo was when you sold your assets. I think you hit the high water mark of that cycle, in my opinion. Because I remember when that happened, and you got 
a great price for it, and then like eight minutes after you closed, the world was falling apart. Did you see that coming? Did you see the financial markets melting down? Look, I'm, I'm not about to say I was smart enough to see everything coming. Right. But I, what I will say is nothing felt good. Right. Nothing felt right. Right. We were getting offers that made no sense to me on virtually everything in our portfolio. And at this point in time, you know, we got north of a $6 billion company that I built from a yellow pad. Right. And in the boardroom, I have more to lose than anybody in that room. For sure. I got my net worth on the line. Right. And so I'm highly focused on big trends and what's happening. I saw financing that made no sense to me whatsoever. Totally. I saw mezzanine financing. I'm talking about bank financing. I saw mezzanine financing that made no sense. I saw buyouts at prices that made no sense. Equity office had just been sold for a giant number. Crazy number. Crazy number. Um, and we were a complicated business. We had a lot of disparate investments, yep. really interesting investments, but it wasn't just pure office. Right. So there weren't a lot of natural buyers. Morgan Stanley came to me, and honestly, they wanted two things. They loved the company, and, but they also wanted our team. We had a great team, yeah. and they had this big concept of you know rolling North America up under me and this team, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, I said, look, I'm, I'm, you're welcome to have the team. I can't discuss any of this with you until after the sale occurs, because I didn't want to be recused from the board meetings. Right. right? So um, we got it done, six and a half billion dollars. It was way over leveraged. I told them it wouldn't work. They put a billion one of equity up, and I said, it, it, you can't run a real estate business on that much leverage. Right. Everything's got to work perfect, and it, yeah. we're going into some serious headwinds, in right. my opinion. Right. So, if I've ever, if I've learned one thing, is leverage. If you don't have the cash to pay it down, is bad. It's it just is. You can't over leverage. To because I think when you get into an uncertain market and market, the market gets more difficult. People use leverage to get yield, and I think that's dangerous. So like, were you? So did you go with them when you sold? Did you go over to that and then operate? I did. The, the day I after we that. closed, um, I joined forces with them. We negotiated a deal. Um, I did that for about two months, and I finally, these were friends of mine too, I mean, I knew all these, this team at Morgan Stanley, and I, I flipped to New York, I said, look, we gotta have dinner, I met with them, and I said, guys, I feel like I'm running the post office. You know, you've got 15 people overseeing everything we do, um, there's a wonderful team of people, many of them are here today, mm -hmm. um, underneath me that can run the business, you don't need me. Yeah. And, you know, let's just tear this agreement up, you don't owe me a nickel, I'm gonna go, focus on my family office. And so that's what we did. Okay, and so one last thing on that. So when then when you go back and buy it back, and then I wanna get into Crescent currently, did they come to you? No. Um, Barclays put up the bulk of the debt. Yeah. And they never syndicated that debt. It was about so it was 3.7 billion, yeah. Yeah, that they, held, it had been paid down some, yeah. and that Barclays approached me and said, hey, would you like to buy your old company back? This was in 2000, the spring of 2009. Right. Just sold it in August 2007. Right. And they knew they were going to get the keys back, and I said, I would love to buy it back, but you're not going to like the number. And I said, I don't even know how to value anything right now, because I mean, the world was in meltdown. It was a meltdown. free fall, yeah. totally. So we... It's a long story, but the short version is by fall, we ultimately negotiated a deal to buy it back in partnership with Barclays. And it was the single best real estate deal I've ever done. Totally. Um, but it was right place, right time, all about timing and structure, a good structure. So the sale had to be the single best sale in real estate. Maybe you have other industries you've done that well at, but that had to be the number one there, right? And then the number oh, yeah. one buy after it? I count my blessings every day. Do you have I mean, a shamrock in that. your pocket? Or what? August 3rd, 2007. Yes, awesome. Okay, so tell me about Crescent today. Well, Crescent today, we've got a great team, about 130 some odd people. Yeah. Um, between assets under management and buying power, we're 
call it north of 10 billion. And um, look, I'm just blessed to have a great team. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like I'm a cheerleader. I serve hot coffee. Yeah. Pat people on the back. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I love my involvement. Yeah. But I'm I'm chairman. We've got two co CEOs, um, and just you know, wonderful development team. And Suzanne Stevens, our CFO, has been with me since 1994. A lot of there's a lot of uh, long term people. That that would be my comment. Is what I I've seen is people come to work for you and they stay with you. It's because you've had a team that a lot of the same people, and I know all of them, or most of them, and they've stayed together through through the whole process, which is which speaks to, it's got to speak to your culture, right? I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful culture, and it's, we have a lot of uh, youth now in the, you know, amongst the team, and it's, it's great to see. Okay, so you're making all these investments, oil and gas, and um, Canyon Ranch, and do, do you have one type of investment that you kind of like the best? Is it like real estate versus oil and gas versus, I mean, do you, operating companies, you don't care? It's just all fun? I like, I like good deals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like bad deals. Yeah. No, I, I love when there's really good alignment between the management team and ourselves. I love things that can scale in a big way. Right. Which is oil and gas, our aerospace businesses um, are very scalable. Canyon Ranch is very scalable. Uh, we're even in eSports, which is teeny tiny today, but very scalable because they're in big uh, industries that are moving quickly and growing. And it's just, uh, so I love being in that. I love, and I love focused efforts. I don't like to dispense my time and lots of little things. Yeah. So did your kids lead you into esports? Travis did. You know, yeah. My oldest son, he he played a particular game going through high school, even yeah. though he loved, you know, outside sports. He was he was a gamer and still is, I think. Um, and so yeah, we had a this opportunity to buy a team and you know looked at it and it was an interesting opportunity. I said, but the only way I would do this is if we partnered with somebody you know, like a major sports franchise, and fortunately I'm good friends with the Joneses, and I called them, and we met, and we partnered, awesome. bought it together. So I went to um, an eSports, because I wanted to go check it out. I went up in Allen to an eSports event. It was unbelievable. Oh, it's crazy. The passion in, the, in, in that building, it was a crazy. A third of the world population, 3.2 billion people are gamers, a third. The, in the U.S., the gaming industry eclipses in size both the music as well as the film industry. Right. And if you look at the size, just in the U.S., it's a $60 billion industry, and it's growing by about $10 billion a year. 60. How, are there, how many teams are there? A jillion, or is it just a limited number of teams? There are a lot of teams, but it's the, the industry itself is a lot more than the team. That's one of the things we found out after investing in this. So now... Um, we merged into a public company. The public company has a lot of other attributes other than just the team. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has a lot of interesting growth. Right. We just need to get it listed on the U.S. exchange. Right oh. now it's on a Canadian. I think we're going to be talking about that in about five years or six years, what a good buy that was. But so the, I, I will say this. The, the next Disney will come out of the gaming industry. Okay. Write that down. We'll have you back. And uh, yeah, that's, that's gonna happen. And I think we may have found it. And it's a business we invested in that's private called Probably Monsters. Write that Crazy down. Crazy name. <laughs> but watch, watch this business called Probably Monsters. In the room Harold the Ryan, deal. Harold, Harold Ryan is uh, the guy that runs it. He's a genius. Yeah. And is it, it's a private company or is it? Pri private company. Private company. Okay, so. Um, Pandemic, I, I'm, I got that in a rearview mirror, but uh, I want to ask you what you learned or what changed you. Like for me, I've always been running from one fire to the next, and my wife would tell me, Keely would say, Bill, you're not living life, you're just running through it. Like you know when a young kid will walk down the street and they see a butterfly or something, they'll watch the butterfly, I'm just on fire running to wherever I'm going. 
And I think the pandemic uh, made me want to live a little more, like, and, and, and that life is, is precious, and, yeah. and I just want to focus on experience and relationships more than I had. What, did you have any effect on, on oh, you with the profound. pandemic? profound. First of all, I mean, from a business perspective, I've never been more frightened, yes, fearful in my life. I thought it was going to be great. There was no playbook. Right. There, it just, and, and you had the wild card of what is the government going to do? Right. You know, and we saw, in hindsight, I think will be proven some pretty wacky things. Totally. You know, may, there were some good things. Right. But there were some pretty wacky things we did. Yes. And it was, it was frightening. You know, I started thinking about all the employees that I'm responsible for in one way or another. It's thousands of people. And it was scary. Take a company like Canyon Ranch and you just shut shut down. down. And we have, you know, the ex-surgeon general of the U.S. on our payroll. We've got doctors. We've got, you know, people that are specialists in their fields. You can't lose them. You cannot, you couldn't rebuild the business without those people. So how do you keep them? That was scary. How long was Canyon Ranch shut down? Was it months? Uh, you know, let's call it a year, but it depended on what market we were in. Wow. Yeah. Because we're big fans of Canyon Ranch. We're there twice a year and we love awesome. it. Awesome. It's, it's, I think it's the gold standard of, of that for sure. So um, um, you think people are coming back to the office? You know, it's kind of driving me crazy. I've got buddies that are tenants in my buildings. And I think work from home should be illegal. It should be against the law. And if, yes, and if I could run and get elected, I would, that would be the first, first law I would pass. But I, ta- I go to like on trips, golf trips with these guys and they got, they're in my building, one of my buildings, he's got 40,000 feet. He, he says, everybody's coming to work February 1st and he gets the hamburger man and you can bring your dog and they're having babysitters, donuts at lunch. And like 10% of the people show. And they're tracking productivity, and I don't think productivity is the same. There's no collaboration when you're working no, from home. In my I don't opinion. know how you build a culture. Right. How do you build a culture on Zoom? Right. I will say this. I have not seen one big idea, and that, that's what I do. I look for big ideas. I've not seen one big idea come out of a Zoom call. I don't think they're going to, I don't think that's going to happen. Can you process things and kind of advance the ball? Sure. And it's probably pretty efficient in certain situations. But yes, people will come back to the office. Look, it's not keeping anybody away from sporting events and concerts, right? They're all full. I totally agree. It's totally back. I totally agree. But for some reason, we had this transfer of power that is probably similar to when unions were started from employers to employees. Totally. And if you look at the age demographic, I think it's all at the younger age. And so all of a sudden they were empowered to, hey, I can stay home, I'm productive Friday, Monday, and all they're doing is getting, creating a longer weekend. Now I realize they may be working some, but when I start hearing dogs barking, you know, in the back, I'm trying, we're trying to have a conversation, like this is silly. So. I think they come back, I think economics is gonna drive it. I think it's gonna take time. I'm sure, I think it nibbles on the edges of the office business, it will. It'll have an impact. Definitely has an impact on what we at Crescent are looking to buy. I think there's commodity product that's just not gonna be competitive. I agree. So it, it will have an impact, a lasting impact, but people will come back. So do you think that's a couple years? I mean, it's going to evolve, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so it, too. I think, I think it's a couple of years. You know, I would drive down the street. It's going to be economics. When people start seeing they're paid differently than the, than the other person right. who's going in, right. they're ultimately, right. it's, it's, I agree. it gets chased the dollar. Like, I would be driving during the pandemic and see 15 people on bikes at 2 in the afternoon. I go, that's work from home right there, baby. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, what are your biggest concerns, like maybe uh, in our industry or in, in the world, if you want to go that way? But Okay, I've got, I have, I, I would say there are two. And the first one 
may be a bit of a surprise. The first one that probably eclipses everything and it affects everybody in the room that's involved in the real estate industry, which I think is everybody in the room, is population. I follow population growth intensely. I look at a lot of data. We were blessed in the United States for 40 years, from 1970 all the way to 2010, that we grew at 1% a year on average. And 1% on what is now 330 billion, billion people right. is, a lot. is a lot, right? right. 330 million people. So um, if, you think, if you took that 1%, just between now and 2030, we would add the equivalent in the United States of 26 Dallas, Texas. 26. Wow. That has been the fuel behind the real estate industry for a long time. Yeah. We are currently not adding at 1%. We're far less than that. In fact, some of the stats even show we're not adding net-net. So we're, we're, we're shrinking. We're actually shrinking to flat. Do you think it's because of the aging population? or It's the aging population. It's just young people are deferring having kids. Got it. I think the pandemic kind of put a lot of things on halt. Um, so there are a lot of factors. And, and that, I, I, don't, I won't say it worries me, but it definitely impacts thinking about where do you want to invest how do you want to invest? And I'm not saying you step out of the real estate industry. Real, real estate industry, particularly like in this market, is going to be phenomenal. I think so, too. So this is a great place you want to be. But you're really going to have to look at demographics. It's going to force you to look at demographics more than ever because where are, if we're not having a lot of growth, we're, when you have growth, everybody kind of fills up and adds, even places that are, you know, terrible work environments. Right. But when you don't have that growth, you're going to see shrink, substantial shrinkage in certain markets, and you're going to see growth in other markets. Right. So we need to be very aware of where we grow. That's, that's my first issue. Okay. Um, my second issue is, and, and I don't want to make this political, like it, it, I, but I will, so I'll dance around a little on that, but I, will, I want to be direct. I worry about government policy now more than ever because we've become so darn politicized. Right. Just as an example, if you fractured. take this bill that was just signed by Biden, yeah. this is stupid. This is stupidity yeah. on steroids. Yep. I'm going to just take one part that will impact a lot of people in this audience. They, they, us, we, are going to spend 87 billion more dollars, excuse me, 80 billion more dollars annually on the IRS. Okay, so the government says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on everybody $400,000 in income and above. We're not going to touch anybody below. And that actually was in the bill, documented in the bill. They removed it. So now they've got the authority to go wherever they want, but they still say, I believe us when we say it, we're really focused on 400000 and above. So I Google how many taxpayers are there 400,000 and above. You know how many there are? 2.8 million. 2.8 million, okay? 2.8 million taxpayers, 400,000 and above. So I take, okay, 87,000 agents is what they're going to hire. What's that divided now, who, by 2.8 million? There may be an IRS agent in the audience. I hope not. But <laughs> who, with all the job openings on the planet right now, who would pick, I want to be an IRS agent. I mean, who would do that? Well, it's a but they're going to pick these people. They're going to be totally untrained. Right. You could fill up AT&T Stadium, Cowboy Stadium, with this eight, it's spooky thought, with 87,000 IRS agents. So that's one agent for every 32 people. So you divide it. Okay, that's, I, I okay, wanted to. Okay, so that's I, one agent for every 32 people. So let's say they audit 10%. They're going to have to collect... $280,000 from every single one of those audits just to break, break even, even. On, the, on the $80 billion. This is stupidity. Right. What are we doing? Right. And I will tell you that I think most people that make 400000 or, or above, I, they turn all their stuff over to 
you know, a qualified tax yeah, lawyer, tax cheat. accountant, they just and they're their prepared, taxes. and you just pay it. I mean, totally agree. Is there cheating in there? I'm sure there is. Yeah. But it's not rampant. You know, one way we could save money on all those IRS agents is have them work from home. There you go. <laughs> you know, they won't be productive. We won't have to worry about it. I like that. That's save awesome. on the overhead. So I, I worry about that. And then I could go on and on about government policy. But government policy, the whole thing with clean energy, this is, look, it's important. The climate, obviously, is important. I'm not at all saying totally. it isn't. But let's be scientific about it and not political. Right. And it makes no sense what we're doing. All of these incentives are going to create craziness, bad investment. Um, it will not clean up the environment. Right. Electric vehicles are well, the first issue. Well, we can't even, the grid won't even handle it if everybody goes and buys all the, oil, the vehicles they want. And plus, one of the things for me is drives me nuts is, you know, batteries, all the destruction of getting what is what goes into a battery. You're the smart guy. Uh, Cobalt, nickel, oh, lithium. Okay, right. The, and the so they're mining all for all that stuff. And then what do you, how do you dispose of it? And a battery doesn't create energy. A bad, I mean, right. I'm an old electrical engineer. Right. A battery stores energy, right? You've right. got to feed something into the battery. You've got to put energy in the battery. 82% of that comes from hydrocarbons. Right. So what are we doing? Right. You know, it, none of this is well thought out. And, and the environmental destruction of mining, lithium, that, and that's cobalt. My part. That's my point. I, has anybody in the room, anyone in the room ever seen a cobalt mine in Africa? It's horrible. It was, it's frightening. Right. Right. Child labor, you know, to create one Tesla battery, you got to go dig up somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 pounds of earth to create a 1,000 pound nest of batteries for a Tesla. This is, this is stupid. Right. I'm not saying we shouldn't go electric on vehicles. Yeah. But let's do it in a Moderately. thoughtful, smart totally. way. So, not let the government dictate it. So one of the things about politics, and I'll get off of politics, but is I tend to be a moderate, right? I, like, give me the middle with a, uh, with a person that has morals, that's, that morally is focused on us instead of getting reelected, right? Yeah. And I, I just don't know how we've gotten to where we're on so many extreme sides. There's no middle anymore. No, we've got to have term limits. Right. I, I totally agree with that. I'll stop. I'll probably apologize. Yeah, I'll stop. So get me started. Tell me about your new project in Fort Worth. I'm very excited about it. I love that site, it. by the way. That's oh, a great it's a site. great site. And, you know, I can't believe I drove by it so long, scratching my head thinking, I need to do something on that site because yeah. I go right in front of it every day to and from the office. Um, it's right in the middle of the cultural district. We're going to have a 200-room Crescent Hotel. We're going to, you know, take that brand and thoughtfully expand it around the U.S., hopefully. Um, first expansion will be in Fort Worth. Um, next to that's going to be a canyon ranch, about 25,000 er square feet urban canyon ranch. Awesome. Um, we're going to have 170 luxury apartments and then 168,000 square feet of office space, which all of our companies are going to go in there and we'll take, I don't know, 25% to a yeah. third of the building. Yeah. We have great interest. It's basically full. Um, and we're well under construction and it's all so moving along. I'm happier when I'm building something than when I'm trying to build it, you know, if building a deal. And I think Fort Worth is a market um, I would love to build a building in. I've built one over there and I'd like, like I've been looking for years for a site. Um, and because if you come from Dallas and go to Fort Worth and build an office building, you really have to do it right, right? And I think that uh, Fort Worth has a perception of the existing market. And I think if you build quality, they'll pay for it and they'll move into it. Do you agree with me on that? Oh, totally. We, we need new you, development in Fort Worth. You, we, it's, they, you do. I it, mean, it, I you mean, need it a is couple of guys like me to run over there and do something. Yeah. I agree with it because Fort Worth tends, and I love Fort Worth. I mean, because I worked there for three years when I worked with the Bass family, but it, they tend to be more conservative than Dallas. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I sometimes say in Fort Worth, you have to 
I actually think about what kind of car I drive because people will have opinions based on that. <laughs> in Dallas, you, you wouldn't think twice about what car you drive. No. I mean, just everybody no. drives up in all yeah. kinds of sporty things. I'm still not driving a Ferrari. It's just a little different. But okay. I love both cities. General outlook for Dallas-Fort Worth. Like, I kind of think this is the place to be. I think it's just going to stay great. I mean, I, I think we're going to have some stress because of the economy or recession or whatever, whatever's going on. But don't you feel like it's going to continue to grow because of the pro-business outlook on, from the city and how people operate? Yeah, we want ab to come. Abs absolutely. I, the thing that I um, think we all need to be mindful of is that great cities are defined not by their mass, but by their character. Yes. So how do we create more character within these cities, you know, things like Woodall Rogers Park, you know, I just, that really helps define an area and it anchors and it creates, you know, that, um, uh, it creates the character yeah. that really defines a city. Yeah. So those things are very important. So if a kid coming out of college comes to you and he goes, Mr. Goff, Give me some advice. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in focus on relationships and learning your trade. Don't focus on the money because yep. it's about getting around the right people. Because for me, you got around the right guy, but you delivered. For me, it's been that way, too. I've had people help me and I've gotten in the right position and I could kind of gauge what was going on so I could figure out. One of the things I think is living in a void is bad. You want to understand how everybody else is doing, but it's getting in front of working the right people. Working from home. Huh? Working from home. Working from home. Would that be a void? It. It's illegal. <laughs> but so what would you say to a young person that comes looking for advice? Um, number one, take this thing that we're all tethered to, turn it off, and put it down. Right. That's number one. For some period of time in a day so good an hour yeah. start with 30 minutes yeah and just think um number two have a plan and work it and i carry mine with me can't pull it out because of these are my it's kind of my plan right and i constantly modify it right sometimes weekly sometimes daily but i have a plan right and i work it so have a plan and work it Three, I would um, read the four agreements. You can read it in two nights. It is by Don Miguel Ruiz, R-U-I-Z. Um, it's a life-changing book, in my opinion. I read it at least once a year. I require all my kids to read it. Um, there's just He basically explains four things you need to do. In life. In life, and it's very simple, and it's. I think about those four things every day. I have a little card that I carry around that has the four things. But I want you to read the book. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, and then you know, find a great mentor and really listen. And it's okay to emulate. I think some people are hesitant to emulate. Yeah. I think it's good to emulate. You know, I, I have to say I learned things from Richard, and I tried to emulate those. Yeah. Um, there were certain characteristics I didn't want to emulate, right. but I learned a lot. So pick and choose, you know, those that are mentors and, and emulate and stay humble. It's so important. Um, I, you know, I feel so blessed every day when I wake up and to be in this country or people have fought for my, our freedoms yes. and the ability to do what we want to do. Yes. Um, I do spend and devote a certain percentage of my time back to the military because it's very, very important to me. Totally. Um, and I think it's often overlooked. And I could go on and on, but those are some of the things that I would point out. For me, like I run from big egos. Like I just think uh, anybody that's had success or, or been able to create wealth or in their life is lucky and blessed, right? We should be grateful. And so usually I always try, I have a rule. It's I've got a few rules on myself, but if I meet somebody that's got a big, big ego that wants, you know, everybody focused on them, I'm, I usually try to uh, shake their hand and keep moving. So, 
Any questions? Does anybody have a question that, that I haven't covered? It's got to be. Come on. Do you believe in work from home? <laughs> Joe, do you believe in work from home? Pangburn? That a boy. <laughs> okay, so then I'm going to ask you one more then, if nobody okay. can ask. Sorry, I, I have one question. Yeah, so uh, my name is Panache. Um, I'm finishing off. Uh, my undergrad. Oh, over here. And I was curious to know, um, you being involved in a multitude of industries and really putting your teams within them, how do you formalize any organization, I guess your strategy for organization for all these um, emerging um, sectors and your already established sectors? And how, since there is a multitude in multitude of sectors in different industries. What's your strategy on organization for propelling them? Let me make sure I understand the question. You saying what, how do I organize myself to attack different industries in different? Correct. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you know, in the real estate, I've got this team and we've got a wonderful uh, charter that we can basically buy anything in real estate anywhere on the planet. We don't do that. We stay pretty focused, but theoretically we can. And that team does a great job of identifying what makes sense, what doesn't. But in the family office, we have, call it 20 people, and we take, as I mentioned, big concentrated bets. And so um, we're, I'm a data nut. Um, by the way, I go home on the weekends and I have, I'm old fashioned, I have the old, you know, satchel that came from some conference back whenever, and I fill it with just, during the week, I fill it with things I want to read, and by the time the weekend comes, I've got a whole satchel full of things I want to read. I go home and I, I love doing that, and I just pour through information. Um, so out of that, you know, come up with an idea, or someone in the office has an idea, and we organize around it. So, you know, when we had the idea in 2015 to start investing in oil and gas again, I'd been an investor many, many years ago with Richard, but I decided it was a great time to enter. You know, I said, look, here's how much capital I want to allocate, and let's go after it. And I took the one person in the office, a guy named Wilkie Collier, who, was, who had been spearheading our view of that industry, and we organized around him, you know, a team inside and outside the firm to go execute that plan. And so, you know, we mainly bought public securities at first, and then ultimately that led to the creation of what is now called Crescent Energy, which is a New York Stock Exchange company. But, you know, I try to find somebody, typically they're pretty young, they're energetic, they're smart, and they're willing to work really hard in the office, not at home. <laughs> um, we've been back to work for two years. I mean, so I don't, we've we never really left the office, to be me, honest with you. But me either. Whatever. I promise you. Um, so, and, and we organize around them, and, you know, I try to find some good mentors, like, you know, in the case of Wilkie, I brought in John Brumley, who's a, um, even older than me, if that's possible, um, who I really respect in that industry. And I kind of had him in as a mentor for Wilkie, and you know, we just we organized around it. Aerospace, I didn't know anything about it, you know, but this really interesting deal came in, and so my son said, you know, hey dad, there's you know one guy that used to coach his wife in soccer, um, and he's been in the consulting business in aerospace for McKinsey or one of the big firms for many years. Let's ask him if he wants to run this company because we didn't have a CEO. So it's I people, said I don't. Right? Yeah. So it's all about people. Okay. A anybody else? Yeah. John, could you address supply chain and what you see that will support Ukraine in the oil price war? Well, um, uh, two questions in there. In terms of supply chain. You know, I think the supply chain is going to right itself here relatively quickly. Um, in fact, I think we're going to have a surplus of things like computer chips here at some point. Um, but the economy works really well to fill those voids. Um, and this was 
just a weird disruption that we've never experienced in our life with the pandemic that just caused really odd shortages that none of us could ever have even dreamed of. Um, the, the war in Ukraine is, is really interesting in the impact that it's gonna have with Russia. You know, Russia is, has been highly dependent on U.S. companies, not only service companies, but also oil companies to exploit their oil. Most of the oil that it's, most of the productive fields have been found and developed over the last, call it 10 to 20 years by majors, all of whom are out. Even companies like Schlumberger, they're out. So there's no expertise left in the country. And so this is, we're gonna see, in my opinion, a very sharp decline of production in Russia. No one's gonna go back in there and assist them with the expertise. And the longest lateral well in the world was drilled in Russia. Up in, and these are really hard to get to places. I'm talking about Siberia. Um, so th I, I've read a lot about it, and, and Russia is going to be, you know, it's Europe is dependent on it, and they're going to have to figure out how to continue to get their gas uh, and oil from, from Russia. But at some point, that's going to be a real problem. And it's not anything that we wrote in our oil thesis that kind of underpinned our oil investment, but it's happened, and it's not the way you want to have something happen but it's gonna be, it's even further going to add, call it fuel to the fire of an uptick in oil prices. We're woefully underinvested, underinvested on this planet in oil, woeful. I'm talking about trillions, trillions. And, and if we ever get pro-energy policies, it's gonna take years to catch up. So don't, years. I kind of think oil's gonna be expensive for a long time. Are you bummed it, out about that? No, not, not really. <laughs> you know, oil, oil should have really never been in the kind of 50 to $80 range. Definitely not sub-50. It really didn't totally make economic sense there. Yeah. I mean, people made sense of it with quick production out of the Permian in certain places. But the reality is it's kind of priced right now for to really generate the right economics for new incremental production. But... When Henry Kravis came, well, I, I actually went to them, to KKR, with the idea of merging our company, and I had dinner with Henry during the middle of the pandemic, without masks up in New York, and we talked about merging our businesses. He told me, and it's absolutely true, he said, John, we're never going to be able to raise another nickel in private equity right. for oil and gas investment. And that's true for all these private equity firms. So all that capital's drying up because of ESG. Yeah. So all of this feeds into this equation um, that's, you know, going to further uh, exacerbate the problem in that commodity. If we added 100 times the number of electric vehicles that we have today, 100 times, we would not reduce demand on hydrocarbons 10%. Wow. So again, I ask, what the hell are we doing? Right. I mean, let's come up with a plan with really smart people who know what they're doing, and let's go execute that. Let's don't have politicians dream up a bunch of wacky stuff that's just gonna do nothing. Totally agree. Anybody else? You got one? Yes. Uh, how did your company look at ESG and how are you factoring in any ESG into your future developments? Who? Wow, that's a tough one. It's a good question. I have a lot of feelings on it, but I'll try to condense it. Um, I think there's components of ESG, uh, environmental, social governance, for those of you who may not know what the acronym stands for, um, that are important. Very important. And I would like to think we've embraced the important ones a long time ago. We didn't need the, somebody to come up with this acronym to make us say, oh, we need to have you know, as many, let's balance the workforce and have women and you know, minorities and all the, let's do that. That's something we've been focused on for a long time and no one had to tell us to do it. We've just done it. Um, 
I think the environmental part, there's going to be a lot of poor decisions made as a result of that. Many, many poor. Again, they're going to be politically driven. They're not going to be what's right for the environment. Um, so I worry about that. And the governance thing, I think a lot of that is woefully overstated. And it's just causing, it, it's, it's causing a lot, it's going to cause a lot of difficulties, particularly for public companies that have to adhere to these, some of the governance standards to get the right expertise yeah. on boards. So John, I want to thank you for today. I mean, you are awesome, very interesting. I've learned a lot, I took some notes. I think everything that goes wrong from here on out this year should be blamed on work from home. <laughs>tell from the fact that nobody's been rushing for the exits for a long time that this has been one of the best programs we've ever had so thank you so much for being here I know all of you appreciate that and uh, Bill if this real estate gig doesn't work out for you we have a job for you late night <laughs> Late night. he wants to do late night maybe maybe John will go along with you he's, he's looking for another job That's awesome. looks like something uh, and I was going to do an informal poll about how many of you are still working from home but I'm not going to do that because I think Bill might have some people waiting in the hallway for you <laughs> Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. It's been a treat to hear from John and uh, to have Bill share his wisdom and to talk, uh, have them both talk together. And we appreciate you spending your, your lunchtime with us and sharing some incredible insights, John. We really appreciate that. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Bank of Texas, our series sponsor, Stuart Title, and our media partner, Dallas Morning News, and all of you that have been active in our membership for the last several years. I can't thank you enough because of you we're doing programs like this and because you want to continue showing uh, up for co great content. We really appreciate that. Uh, we also want to make sure that you remember um, that our next program, September 22nd, Market Matters, we're going to be focused on the hospitality industry. Uh, that's another topic of conversation we've had today. Uh, so I think it's going to be a great panel discussion, and we hope you'll be there. It's the final Mar Market Matters program of the year. I also want to encourage you to help us support our work in the community through Trek Community Investors on North Texas Giving Day. And that will open up early September, and we'd love to have your support for all the great work that you all do in our community. Um, it's really, really important for really a vibrant city of Dallas. And of course, the biggest night of the year, September 29th, Fight Night 33. Uh, it's really going to be a tremendous night. We really do have very few tables left. So if you want to come, and we're not sell selling any, any individual tickets, so you have to buy a table. We hope to see you uh, there. It's going to be a really great evening. Uh, we think we have some special um, things planned for our major sponsor, Vary, and John Jason McCann's going to be there. We're excited about that, Jason. Thank you. Um, so thanks again for our speakers uh, and for today's program, Bill and John. We couldn't thank you enough, our sponsors, and uh, we hope you will continue listening to our true legends of commercial real estate. Have a great afternoon.